Thank you, Dr. Burmeister. Yeah, I want to <coughs> talk a little bit today about uh, Hattie's Gardens, which is the vocational training program I'm involved in. Uh, it's a vocational training program based on food production, uh, and we have three sites. So I'll give you a little bit of background on that and talk about uh, one of the exciting new partnerships we just forged with the Akron Zoo, and then maybe talk a little bit about some future plans that we have as well. <coughs> Uh, just to give a little bit of background, I, uh, Hattie's Gardens is part of the Hattie Larlam Foundation. It was founded in 1951, uh, basically by the nurse Hattie Larlam. She saw the need to take in kids with very severe or profound disabilities. Uh, she started this out of a farmhouse in a very small community in, in northeastern Ohio. Um, since that time, the foundation has grown uh, exponentially. Uh, we now provide a variety of services, so group homes, uh, the Center for Children is, is still in Manaway, Ohio. There's an integrated preschool also at the main center. Uh, we have day habilitation program for adults with disabilities who can go out into the community, uh, go on field trips, so sporting events, um, you know, t um, which is a concerts and, and the like. And then uh, finally, community services, which is the agency I'm involved in under the Hattie Larlam umbrella. <clears throat> So Community Services uh, is basically a social enterprise agency for Hattie Larlam. Uh, it advocates for and designs programs that serve adults with DD. Uh, specifically, we try to provide gainful employment for the adults with disabilities. We, we are in vocational training for these uh, clients, and we try to provide training not only on work skills, but also social skills, uh, and basically those intangibles you don't often think about when you're holding down a job. So showing up to work on time, good hygiene, how do you uh, deal with customers or coworkers. Um, and we first started with Hattie's Cafe in 2006. It was only with uh, six individuals. At this point, 2014, we're now up over 250 adults with disabilities in a range of programs. Uh, we have a number of cafes. We're now at seven Hattie's Cafes. We provide doggy daycare, uh, which is boarding and grooming at three locations across Northeast Ohio. Uh, and the venture I'm uh, most involved with now is Hattie's Gardens. So Hattie's Gardens, uh, based on these training programs that are well established, um, same type of idea. So uh, instead of providing training through boarding and grooming of dogs, we're now looking at food production as a means of vocational training. Um, we see this as a brand new idea for Hattie Larlam. When we first started in 2011, it was basically a clean slate. Uh, there was not one person in, in the organization that would necessarily tell you that this was something we were looking at even in 2010. But as we saw the rise in local food and uh, you know, kind of applied that to what we do specifically for training, we saw it as a good opportunity for us. Um, we based our research and fact-finding on a couple of other organizations. We have Cleveland Crops, which is located in Cleveland, and the Center for Discovery in New York. I'll talk a little bit about those here. Uh, so the Center for Discovery was really the first idea uh, that came across for us. Dennis Allen, who's the CEO of Hattie Larlam, uh, had the ability and the opportunity to go and tour the Center for Discovery. Uh, basically, this organization is um, <coughs> started in 1977. They're located on 900 contiguous area, uh, acres, so it's a big campus, all uh, self-enclosed. Uh, and in the mid-80s, they got interested in, in food and how it pertains specifically to autism and the rise in autism. They're looking uh, for a link between the modern agri-food system, uh, nutrition, and autism. Of course, autism now is the fastest growing um, subset of DD in the country. We're looking at one in 50 uh, boys now born with autism in the country. So uh, rapidly growing and people are still searching for answers today. Um, but basically this, this organization has uh, a self-sustaining model. They, they grow all their own livestock, vegetables, uh, all on site. And that's what everyone in the organization eats uh, from the group homes that are there to the school, to the hospital, uh, and you name it, it's grown on site. So this was a possible model of expansion for Hattie Larlam, although we wouldn't specifically look just to the autism spectrum. Uh, the next organization that is doing a similar uh, type of vocational training is called Cleveland Crops. And rather than a nonprofit, as Hattie Larlam is organized, uh, Cuyahoga, Co Cuyahoga County Board of DD is who operates Cleveland Crops. Uh, they have upwards of 40 participants now in their training program. They have seven farm sites. Um, they also do a lot of co cooperation with OSU, uh, Ohio State Extension 
has an agricultural site in Worcester, which is not too far from Cleveland. So a lot of their training and education comes through OSU programming. Uh, and they found some a niche for, for revenue building in high-end restaurants. Uh, and of course, they do local farmers markets. And they were also looking at doing a CSA for uh, board staff, so people that work for the county board. Uh, so with that background, what did, what did we hope to accomplish? So we knew we were going to stick to our main mission, which of course was the employment and the training for our individuals. Um, we wanted to also educate our individuals on nutrition and the benefits of healthy eating, and then of course local food. Um, we wanted to prov provide fresh organic produce to the Hattie's Cafe, so somewhat of a vertical integration there. Uh, if you were to walk into a Hattie's Cafe's t Cafe today, you would see vegetables on the salad bar coming directly from the gardens, uh, grown by people with disabilities, and then of course served by people with disabilities. So uh, kind of a unique way to collaborate uh, within our organization. And Den this is Dennis Allen, he's our CEO. Uh, he really has this vision for Hattie Larlam as a sustainable uh, enterprise across Northeast Ohio. Uh, and so founding this, this gardens program was another way towards that, towards that goal. Uh, and as we'll see, these goals have evolved over time. Um, I guess I should mention at this point, this is Hattie's Gardens only. So we're, we're just trying, it's not self-serving, but we're, we're looking to just uh, work within ourselves. At this point, there's not wide collaboration. These are specific goals that would help our organization only. So, uh, so the first garden start, site started in May of 2011 in Bath, Ohio. Uh, Crown Point Ecology Center is located in Bath, and they have a large CSA. They serve about 160 families in Akron and, and other local suburbs. Uh, they're large scale. They're about 12, 13 acres of organic production. They are organically certified, and they've been doing this for a long time, since 1992. Um, so it was nice for us to go in on the ground level with an established local grower, someone who's been doing it for a long time. Uh, they added some other elements to it. They have a lot of educational programming. They house uh, roughly 200 students each summer for uh, benefits of organic eating, uh, nutrition, and some other, some other programming. And then this idea of social justice is something that Crown Point <coughs> uh, first contributed to, uh, to our overall goals. Uh, you know, bringing food to those marginalized in society. So for Hattie Larlam, that would mean uh, promoting healthy eating and local food for adults with disabilities. And then uh, for Crown Point, their goal is mainly uh, to reach the impoverished or lower socioeconomic areas. Uh, just some few small pictures of where we started. We were on basically 400 square feet, so we're looking at eight garden beds here. Uh, that's one of our participants. Uh, this is late 2011, so we're starting to see some season extension techniques here. A um, couple of guys that are working directly, again, hands in the soil. This is, this is about their training, you know. Um, first and foremost, we're trying to teach them the skills it takes to, to become successful in gardening or farming. A little overview of uh, early 2012 here. Um, as you'll see, Hattie's Gardens has rapidly expanded. So although we started with 400 square feet in mid-2011, by early 2012 we had opened up this additional land and we're looking at roughly an acre in 2012. Uh, here's some of our staff. Uh, the guy with his hand on the sign there is our head gardener. His name is uh, William Murray. Uh, he's been a great coworker. He's been with us since the beginning. And some of the participants we have in our program here. As I mentioned, always upward and onward. So 2012, we're at roughly an acre. Uh, we're now providing the produce for the Hattie's Cafes. We're selling to uh, one of the local farmer's markets. And we're starting to gain some momentum and sustainability. So we start collecting food waste from the cafes, so coffee grounds, old vegetable matter, um, and we're doing large-scale composting. Uh, fairly basic methods, you know, so we can keep the guys engaged, but we're doing the best we can to compost. Uh, we're now starting to use organic practices. We're not certified at this point. That'll come a little bit later. Uh, we're doing intensive land management, which will come in handy later when we get into urban environments, uh, but we're resowing uh, beds, you know, uh, season after season, so we're, we're doing uh, tomatoes or cucumbers in the summer, but in the winter we're using season extension techniques and we're planting spinach and lettuce and onions, so uh, intensive land management. Uh, meanwhile, in 2012, we're also approached by Old Trail School. Now, Old Trail School is also located in Bath. Uh, it is a private school, K through eight, um, and it's a fairly well-off school. Uh, so if, if you're not familiar with Bath, Bath is, uh, is a mid to upper 
uh, income community, and uh, Old Trail School definitely reflects that. Uh, but their headmaster liked the idea of this farm to school program, which started in Berkeley, California. They had the resources to send a couple teachers over to Berkeley and learn what they could about that operation. And when they came back, the headmaster was, was sold. He wanted to do it. Uh, Old Trail also had land available. And so they were really looking for a partner that would be able to provide that on-site farming experience uh, and give access for their kids to, to this farm to school ideal. Um, and at this point, it's kind of broad vision casting. There's some other players in the Cuyahoga Valley, which is where we're, we're located. There's another historic farm site called Hale Farm uh, that's around. We're talking about Crown Point still. There's some small family farms that are um, promoted by the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. They're reclaimed old agricultural sites that the uh, park, through what they call the conservancy, has been able to reclaim. And uh, for about a dollar a year, these, these families can stay on land and uh, basically start their own family farms. Uh, so some of the benefits of expansion. In late 2012, we're, we're at a point where we're agreeing with Old Trail School. We want to partner together. Uh, we see it a couple ways. For them, they get their farm to school program for the school. So educational opportunities for the kids. Fresh produce can go into their, directly into the cafeteria. Uh, a lot of teaching opportunities for the school. And then for us, we're looking at an additional training site. So we have the potential now to boost our, our revenue, increase our numbers and training. Uh, so it's a really a nice partnership. There's a quick picture of the groundbreaking there. <coughs> So in uh, April 2013, uh, we opened up roughly two and a half acres with the school. Uh, that's out of a total six to seven that we have available to us. Uh, but we wanted to, I guess, start slowly. Um, so we're now on about three and a half acres. This, of course, allows us to expand our operation and hire new adults with disabilities to work into our program. Uh, the students begin to visit uh, the Farm for Education in, in summer programs. And we start to see the benefits of that education. So think about sciences, you think you're talking about biology and you're talking about chemistry and a lot of applicable studies that can go into agriculture. Uh, we're talking about algebra when it comes to what do you expect out of production out of a certain uh, land mass, you know, so a lot of uh, applicable um, <coughs> benefits for this, for this new partnership. Also in 2013, we began our uh, OFA certification. And of course, we're practicing season extension techniques. One of the things that we really wanted to make sure was happening is that uh, we keep our participants employed 12 months of the year. Of course, in a northern climate, that's, that can be difficult to do. Uh, but at this point, we're utilizing hoop houses, we're using low tunnels, we're using row cover, um, and to, to try to keep these guys engaged 12 months of the year. A few pictures of our, our early development here. <clears throat> A lot of hands-on work here for the guys. That's, uh, these are the footprints for the greenhouses that we'll see later in the year. Uh, Hoop House, this is built by an organization called Tunnel Vision. They're based out of Cleveland. And these guys uh, have an eye to sustainability uh, as much as possible too. So no electrical or uh, fossil fuel inputs into these um, structures. They also, they'll put rainwater collection systems on the side. Uh, they add roll up sides for extra ventilation. So these guys are real thorough, good company to work with. <clears throat> uh, so this is OFA. Basically, as an organization, we decided that it, it was important to us to go through the proper channels and be uh, certified through OFA. We had always been doing the organic practices, uh, but this kind of legitimized those, those efforts. Uh, benefits for us, we think it adds some marketability to our product. So at farmer's markets, uh, we find that uh, having that sticker on uh, one of your bags of lettuce or on the stand itself adds a little bit of marketability for us, adds legitimacy for the customer, and then they're a good resource for us too. So. <clears throat> uh, a little bit more about Old Trail. So beginning of 2014, um, we were still at three and a half acres, but in 2014, so earlier this year, we expanded to six acres at Old Trail. That put us at roughly seven acres total in the two and a half years that we'd been operating for Hattie's Gardens. Uh, we have some big plans for the year, so we're looking to branch out into some new outlets into the community. We're now at three farmers markets, uh, namely Countryside Conservancy, which are the two C's there. 
Countryside Conservancy is, um, provides a lot to local food in Northeast Ohio. So they do educational programming. Uh, they help people find areas that they, that they can start their own gardens. And then they run these farmers markets. So we are now in the Highland Square Market, which is in downtown Akron. And then we're also at their winter market now, which coincidentally is also at Old Trail School. So it kind of all fit together perfectly there. Uh, and then we were also at a Cuyahoga Falls market, which is a, a local town. I'm um, still selling to Hattie's Cafes. Uh, we s now sell to several restaurants in the area. We found some nice restaurants that will support our mission, and they also get the benefit of marketing the local organic produce. Um, we're doing some value-added products. So we're doing uh, mints and tea mixtures and, and different types of dried herbs for sale. Uh, and then we tried the CSA model out for ourselves. So Crown Point had 160 families. Uh, we started with 20, and we offered it through the school, but it went really well this year. Uh, we had produce available 22 weeks of the year, and we will look to expand that next year. It was a nice revenue stream for us, and something I think will continue, uh, because it makes a lot of financial sense for us. Um, <coughs> again, new capacity for growing. Uh, larger scale, we're talking now, blend between the polyculture and monoculture. Uh, we found that if we can ramp up some production of, say, for example, for specifically potatoes, black dried black beans, popcorn, uh, and pumpkins, it helps us with our revenue, which is something we're always mindful of. Uh, while we are a nonprofit and a social enterprise, we still are trying our best to stand on our own. Um, it uh, you know helps our cause within our organization, and uh, and we're making a, a real serious go at it here. Uh, we now add two greenhouses to, again to combat that. Seasonality, we want these guys working 12 months of the year. The greenhouses allow, to allow us to do that. Um, and then we see the overall focus of the gardens program has expanded and evolved. Uh, we're now doing the farm to school programming, the educational services for students at the school, direct sales to customers rather than just the Hattie's cafes, and then um, new collaborations and impacts that we're, we're fo forging in Northeast Ohio. Uh, just a few more small examples of education that we're running at Old Trail. So I talked about this farm to school. If you need some more information, um, definitely go online. Uh, this basically idea that nutritional eating can mix with uh, educational program and, and good health. And this all started in Berkeley, California. Uh, again, I talked about some of the curriculum you might see. So science classes, uh, math classes, we've even, you know, just as basic as artwork so kids can come up and, and be in a nice green peaceful space to to work on art uh, the kids have run <coughs> have uh, honeybees that they can go and access and so that's a, a nice teaching tool for them um, and then they've also got their hands in their soil so they're doing some garlic planting they've planted a three sisters plot and that's a uh, plan to expand for next year so they're looking at uh, even more that the students can actually be uh, fully engaged in of course, the great benefit of fresh organic produce grown 400 yards from the school is now available right in the cafeteria. A few more pictures of uh, early expansion this year. Those are the two greenhouses. Uh, we were able to get this through a Summit County block grant. Um, a lot of uh, the fundraising that goes on are through uh, foundations or through uh, private donors, but we are uh, supported also by Summit County block grants. We are also supported by Summit County Board of DD. Um, and so these grants go a long way to improving our, our ability to uh, continue our training and to uh, con continue expanding. Here's one of the guys, you know, hands in the soil. This is early 2014. <coughs> uh, you can see here some of the popcorn. Uh, we, we look for a little bit of uh, niche products. So a lot of people do sweet corn in our area. But popcorn, we think, is a kind of a cool niche product. Uh, the ad added benefit of this is that when we're ready to dry and package the popcorn, it is sent off to another Hattie, Hattie program, so another vocational training program. They take in our, dried, our black beans, our popcorn, and the guys on site will dry that and package it for us, and then it'll go out for sale. So uh, again, kind of uh, doing what we can to support the other programs in Hattie's. Uh, we're looking at a, a large uh, pumpkin and potato field here. Uh, just a, a point, uh, some of this is uh, buckwheat. So, you know, with our organic practices, we practice a lot of cover cropping. <clears throat> and some of the products that we have. Again, some niche products, uh, purple carrots, red carrots, uh, some heirloom tomatoes. <clears throat> and this is what we got out of the field for pumpkins and squash and um, 
there's about 10 tables full of acorn, delicata, you know, spaghetti and butternut squash, and then loads of pumpkins this year. Uh, my buddy Rick showing off the farm stand. This is just a small one the guys set up to sell at our office. Uh, it's our first CSA share, another view of some of the land we have at the school, and then uh, most of the crew we had in early summer. So definitely expanded from that first picture we took with the sign. Okay, uh, so this is the newest project we have going on. Uh, winter 2013 at a Countryside Conservancy. Again, that organization keeps coming up. Um, they held a networking event and were approached about potential open land near the Akron Zoo. Um, and Doug Piakosh is our main contact at the zoo. He's the VP of Planning and Conservation. Um, the early meeting was very positive for us. We can see, already see the benefits that both of the organizations provide. Um, <coughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that this is going to take off. So this is winter 2013. Um, just a little bit of background on the zoo. So the zoo has developed um, their site and their organization with an eye towards sustainability. And so in 2009, they, had, they created this master plan. These are the bullet points from the master plan. So you can see some pretty audacious goals. And as, as Doug would say, he calls them BHAGs, which are big, hairy, audacious goals. This is kind of a funny, <laughs> funny term, but I, I, I like it. So, uh, so you can see fossil fuel reduction by 50% by 2020, waste to produce zero waste, which is absolutely audacious. Uh, water, reduce water and sewer use by 50%, and then the one on the bottom where we most align, of course, local food, support local food production through our operation. Why is this important for the zoo? <clears throat> well, unlike some zoos where you have a lot of green space around the actual zoo itself, uh, the Akron Zoo sits smack dab in a very lower socioeconomic neighborhood in downtown Akron. Um, if you were to look at maps, the zoo would be lost in a sea of small homes and, you know, neighborhoods. Uh, so the zoo has a vested interest in uh, land baking and salvaging property value. Uh, they see the value in, in helping their neighbors and not only um, keeping their own space within their fences nice, but the neighborhood outside their fence. They give this example of Disney World versus Disneyland. Disneyland was started and they only bought the property that they needed just for the park. But what happened to the land outside? Disneyland is now in a lower socioeconomic neighborhood, downtrodden, not very nice to drive through to get to, the, to Disneyland. Uh, Disney World was developed with an eye towards this, what's better for the community. So they bought the land they needed for the park and then the surrounding area they purchased. There's nice hotels, there's nice shopping areas. It's a nicer experience for the consumer. But they see this as, you know, not only for the, good for their business, but they see it as, as the right thing to do for the community. So that's important. Um, <clears throat> the zoo came in and they, they had this land because they've been doing this land breaking project. Uh, Akron was hit hard as were many Rust Belt cities with uh, foreclosures and a housing crisis. And this neighborhood is, is far and away one of the worst in Akron. Uh, so we're talking about uh, dozens and dozens of properties right alongside the zoo that are now abandoned or foreclosed on. Uh, the zoo saw this as an issue. They've been purchasing as much land or as, as many homes as they can. Uh, and then the city will come in, survey these homes and, and demolish them. Um, it's in an effort to salvage property value. It also creates green spaces for us. And that's where we met up with them at this networking event. You know, he comes over and he says, I, I hear what you're doing with your gardening program. Sounds very interesting, nice mission. Well, we have all this land, so can you help us out? And so that's where we kind of combined. Um, some of the other things going on in this area, you have AMHA in that uh, neighborhood that is uh, salvaging the Moon Mallison neighborhood. And basically they wipe clean this whole neighborhood and put up real nice, I'm talking really nice houses, nice landscaping. You would not know it would be a government assistance neighborhood. Um, they promote some of these other uh, community gardens. So Akron Grows, Euclid Community Garden Program. <coughs> This is a, a quick map of the zoo itself in color. Uh, there's the four goals they have for land development goals, land banking, pur purchase of distressed properties, green space, and then community garden partnerships. On the bottom and towards the left, you can see uh, some of the streets that abut against the zoo. And actually Edgewood is the street that we work on. And these are some of the properties that uh, we were first approached about. And you'll see on this next slide, uh, very similar. So Akron Zoo, top to the left, uh, and then Edgewood is the street with the yellow line through it. 
Uh, and these were the first few proposed sites that we uh, dealt with the zoo. So you're looking at um, not only single plots, but contiguous plots. Um, this site three here is uh, about 10, 10 to 12 plots um, together. And this is just a small piece of, of what the zoo owns. So this is one street, but if we look up and to the left and we had that perspective, you would see plenty of lots that the zoo owns there too. <coughs> Uh, some of the other supports that we had while we were in this partnership, uh, Akron City and Office of Sustainability is really promoting this shift towards um, urban development and local food. So in 2012, about 5% of their urban planning budget was dedicated to urban gardens. Um, food Policy Coalition, uh, Dr. Burmeister and I were talking about these earlier. Uh, Summit County itself has a uh, volunteer-based uh, food policy coalition. And so some of the work and some of the surveying that the Akron Zoo did in, in determining that uh, urban gardening is a way they wanted to alleviate some of these the property issues come from the Food Policy Coalition. Um, and that coalition actually proposed the Summit County Community Food Charter, which was accepted in late 2012, and it promoted some of these policies and findings that the Food Policy Coalition put together. Uh, we can look at these later if, if we have time. I do have copies of those. They're, they're linked there. Uh, so this is the early rendering of what we wanted to do on that site. Um, this is uh, basically a view, and, I'll, and I'll sh it was site three that I showed you before, so 10 to 11 contiguous plots. It's about three quarters of an acre. This is an early rendering of what we wanted to do, and you'll see how that evolves here in a second. Uh, this is south looking north on that, on that site. Uh, so again, these homes were demolished probably a year, two years before this, this photo was taken. A lot of green space, a lot of open space, a lot of trees too, um, but the potential is there. You can see that. Uh, and this is what it looks like after uh, a few of the trees are removed and uh, we get in with our little walk behind tractor here and we started plowing. And this is north looking south. <coughs> and some of the development on site. So, uh, kept it simple. We have a pole barn, uh, 28 by 48. Uh, we want to leave as much space as we can for the actual gardening going on. Um, but it, a little bit of a project here. So, you know, grading out the, out the land. And, and there was some red tape that we ran into. So uh, where's the water going to go on site? These are some things we had to hash out with the city. Um, you know, and we had to get permitting for some of the structures on site. Uh, but you can see it's starting to come together here. Um, I mentioned the 12 months of the year, we went with Tunnel Vision again. They have a, gave us another nice hoop house here to begin growing into, even while uh, development was underway. And the city was nice enough to put in a new sidewalk for us. Uh, this is a neighborhood that, uh, I mean, you, you just walk down the street, and there's trash, and there's abandoned lots, and there's garbage everywhere, and the, the sidewalks are cracked and, and sometimes non-existent. And so the city saw this as a kick in the butt and they got started on this neighborhood too with us. And uh, the end result here, so this is on our grand opening which was in uh, late September. Um, so again, fairly new site. Uh, it's myself and one of our participants walking through our hoop house um, and looking at uh, basically radishes and uh, cucumbers and some spinach. And there's some of the big players in this whole project. The guy on the right here is uh, is the head of Summit County Board of DD. That's the mayor, second from the right. And then third from the right is Russ Pry. He's the uh, county executive. And my boss, Dottie, on the left. And Doug is in the back, peeking up for And the porcupine. Now, the zoo has like all these animals and stuff, so the, the obviously they have animals. Um, so when the, when the grand opening came, they brought the porcupines out and they had like uh, this owl that they brought out. So it was kind of a cool event. The porcupine ate one of the cucumbers from the hoop house. <laughs> Kind of neat. Uh, and the ribbon cutting. Um, so wh why, is, why else is it important that we're in this neighborhood? Uh, well, this zoo located in southwest Akron is uh, considered a food desert uh, by the USDA. I'm going to pull up a quick map here, if I can. Maybe not. Um, there it goes. <coughs> technical difficulties. Um, so these maps are provided by the Food Policy Coalition. <clears throat> and so they did a full survey of Summit County. 
Uh, hopefully we will look specifically at the neighborhood that uh, the Akron Zoo lies within. Um, but again, we're, we're talking about a, a couple different factors. So not only is this, this neighborhood far from a grocery store from access to fresh produce, we're also talking about um, high levels of, of poverty uh, and then couple that with uh, high population density. So, okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is a Summit County. Uh, any area in pink here is a food desert. And the area specifically that we're looking at here is right off the highway. Um, and these are the two roads that we're looking at. So Edgewood is right here. Uh, the zoo is right in here. Um, so on the very edge of a food desert, but again, we're looking at a giant swath of food desert here. Um, and if we were to pull up the map for poverty and population density, these are the areas that are most highlighted in those other maps. Um, <clears throat> so this is where some of the research came from for the zoo. And uh, another reason why it was important for the zoo to uh, promote this, this urban agriculture and to get involved here. And again, we can look at a few more if we have time at the end. So uh, one of the things we wanted to do, not only take advantage of the land that was there, but we want to bring that food directly to the people that are in the neighborhood, people that need it most. So late this year, um, although the production was not from the zoo site, we brought produce down for several weeks um, from, again, mid-September through the end of October. And we basically set up a farm stand. Uh, it was all of our produce, all organic, all local, grown within, uh, shoot, probably 10, 10 miles or so. Uh, a big thing that we wanted to do for the neighborhood is provide competitive pricing to them. So versus our farmer's markets at, at a higher end area, our prices are lower here. Uh, we're accepting SNAP, which is the new government assistance program, so WIC and EBT. Uh, and that was important to us. It was a fairly easy process to get uh, approved for SNAP too. And uh, there's a organization that's providing free equipment. So the process was made very easy for us. Um, it's something we will be doing until all through next year and as we continue to grow around that neighborhood. Uh, one quick little tidbit, I, I wrote tasting gardens down. As we designed the, group, uh, the, the site and the layout, the fences have some inlets in them. Um, and in those areas, we want to plant, say, cherry tomatoes or strawberries or places that people walking by on the sidewalk just, just go by and pick up stuff as they go, just free. Just, you know, take it, take it as you will. Uh, it's kind of to promote what we're doing and, and, you know, get people excited about what we're doing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the future. And uh, we have plans now for a food hub. Um, and this is something that was identified in talking with Countryside Conservancy that is a big missing piece to local food network in, in Northeast Ohio. So we see this food hub as a local grower co-op and market. So not only for Hattie's Gardens to sell our own produce, but to bring together other community gardens in Akron or local pro producers even in the suburbs, a centralized place that people can come and sell their, their produce um, directly to consumers. And the most important part of this again is that it is in this food desert. Um, we also see it as a processing kitchen um, so if people uh, have uh, excess corn or surplus of berries or something for the year, we want to get flash freezers and give people the opportunity to flash freeze their goods and be able to sell those throughout the winter. It's a way to extend um, the seasonality of produce and a way for people to kind of take advantage of some of the product that they might have been losing in the past. And the final piece of that might be distribution. So again, it's kind of open at this point. Uh, frozen up here. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, just a picture of um, John working the stand. Okay, uh, I did want to show you this. So I talked a little bit about the, the background of this. Uh, we do have plans already drawn up for us. Um, uh, so this is pretty exciting. These just came out uh, earlier in October, uh, one of our board members for the community services agency is, is an architect. And so he's really helped us with our design on some of these uh, projects. All right, so this is <coughs> the now, now approved, it says proposed, but now approved site that we have agreed with the city of Akron that can be used for this food hub. Uh, if you see here, this is our current garden site. So this is the long contiguous 11 plots that we talked about. Around the corner here, we're looking at uh, 
the processing and food hub. Um, so again, smack dab in that food desert just around the corner. Uh, this is what it might look like on site. Um, <coughs> parking on site. We're looking at a potential garden site, so more capacity for us or for some of our participants to grow. And then more community gardening. And this is the early rendering of what we're looking at. Um, an, eye for an eye towards sustainability for this development. Uh, so if you can read that on the right, it is a repurposed shipping container as used as a produce stand. Uh, we're looking at using potential photovoltaic solar panel installations on the roof to help you know, cut down on a fossil fuel use and to conserve energy. Um, <clears throat> gravel drive to limit stormwater runoff. And then a picture from the other side. So those repurposed shipping containers again. And we see this as, as a, a nice piece, a uh, nice collaboration between the zoo and the gardens. Uh, we talked about the processing kitchen, but you know, who's to say we don't have a classroom there too, where we teach people how to cook, why it's important in, to have nutrition, and maybe we have speakers you know, come in and kind of uh, tout the benefits of organic produce and, and local eating. So a lot of potential for that project. <clears throat> Um, again, just some of the economic benefits we, we see from this project. So Akron hit hard by the recession and the housing crisis. Uh, a guy I worked with in the past and kept in contact with, Chris Norman, another OU grad, um, is working for a neighborhood surveyor now, and they just, they've surveyed 90,000 lots in this year alone that are slated for demo. Um, <clears throat> and we see this as, as a good way to provide more jobs, both for our participants in our organization, but also for uh, um, ethnic communities in North Akron. Um, so North Akron has a large uh, population of the Karen people from Burma and they're refugees from Burma. Um, and if it is not the largest, it's, it's one of the largest in, in the United States. Um, and then we're talking about lower socioeconomic neighborhoods. So, so how do we parlay some of these abandoned lots and reclaim lots into economic opportunities for um, people in these neighborhoods and then for these ethnic communities who traditionally may have been growing you know, vegetables at home are now displaced and looking for, uh, for work and for a way to thrive in America. So uh, we believe that uh, you know, this produce is highly marketable to other restaurants. We've already seen that. We're selling to a number of restaurants now. Uh, we will be selling to the zoo's Komodo Cafe. And so we're hoping that uh, you know, a lot of the produce that we either grow in Bath or in Akron will be used in that cafe. Um, <clears throat> talking about growing farmers, so there's a lot of space around, but how do you get people interested in, in really participating in this? Um, so of course for us, we see it as a way that we can grow our training program. We went up to 25 participants in 2014. We see that growing to potentially 40 for next year, and that's what we want. We want to keep uh, the adult DD population engaged and working, earning a paycheck, uh, becoming more independent. Um, and then we can see this as a potential for microenterprise as well. This is something that still needs to be hashed out, but we have this idea in our head for microenterprise, meaning if we have some extra land available, who's to say one of our guys who's been in the program for two or three years can't go off and start his own little business growing, say, just specifically cucumbers or tomatoes. And of course, we would try to provide as much support as we could, but we see that as a potential uh, next step into, into urban gardening and vocational training. <clears throat> uh, we have some educational plans. I, we're strong believers that none of this is really gonna catch hold unless we provide some education. Um, so we have some experience at Old Trail School with the programming there, and the kids are definitely on board there. Um, but how do you translate that into an urban experience for kids who have always grown up in a food desert, may not know the benefits of nutrition or, or could even identify some of the products that we're growing? Um, so we have been in talks with Helen Arnold Community Learning Center. It's an elementary school, again, right around the, the corner from Edgewood Avenue. Uh, you know, potential there, cooking classes, small gardens on site, and really reaching those kids at a young age and, and integrating them into what we're doing around the zoo. Uh, and I talked about the food hub also as a learning center. And you know, while, you, while you're teaching kids in school about the, the benefits, 
you know, the, the adults can come over to the food hub and learn how to cook these specific vegetables that they're purchasing from, from the garden site. Uh, just a quick tidbit here. This is what the zoo's education uh, programming looks like at this point. So they have the Eat Like an Animal campaign. And these are signs that are around their cafeteria and also around the zoo. So any of these signs would be, say, right next to the red, red panda's enclosure. You would see this is what the red panda eats. These are the items that are grown at the garden. Go to the cafe and get yourself some veggies too. So it's kind of a unique uh, marketing tool for us. And it's pretty clever. One of our guys at Hattie's did that. His name is, his name is Matt. He does a heck of a job. Uh, just some extra elements of sustainability that, uh, that we were talking about before. So composting, we, we've gotten pretty good at composting now. We're still collecting scraps from the cafes. Uh, we collect spent grain from two breweries in town. Um, we're looking at potentially composting zoo material. So zoo poo is what we're calling it. Uh, it's actually happening in Cleveland already. So the Cleveland Zoo is composting their manure from the animals and selling it off uh, as an amendment to soil. Um, some other things, we uh, collect wheatgrass mats from local um, like smoothie shops. You know, you, you juice your wheatgrass and then what happens to the mat afterwards? Well, they just throw it out. So we, we collect them, we use them as mulching material, and then we also compost them. We do a lot of rainwater collection. This, is, this was, again, important to the zoo. It's one of their goals to reduce the waste run or water runoff. Uh, our capacity is now at 600 gallons just for the zoo site. And uh, we're going to couple this with drip line irrigation, which is a very uh, specific method of irrigation. You're laying uh, small tubes down that just drip water directly onto the stem versus sprinkler systems, which you know, dissipate into the air. So that com combined with our rainwater collection, we think is a, a fairly sustainable way of irrigating. Uh, we reuse lumber and other construction materials, anything we can get our hands on. So compost bins are all made out of pallets, for example. Uh, we want to make like root washers out of old 55 gallon drums and so there's some potential there. Uh, last thing is our coffee supplier for all the cafes. Uh, his name is Caruso's and they import these big sacks of coffee and they uh, roast them on site and everything. But again, where's the burlap go? They throw it out. So we go by every two weeks and we get a pallet full of burlap and we use it for mulching and for making sacks that we plant potatoes in, and, and a number of other projects. Uh, so just revisiting the zoo's goals, uh, you know, kind of comparing what their goals were with what we're now providing to that operation. Uh, engagement, you know, they, they want to create an understanding of a sustainable operation. Uh, we were just featured last month in a Northeastern Ohio sustainability tour. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the energy and the potential for solar power use. Fossil fuels, while we might not directly impact this uh, by, you know, promoting local food, we're, we're cutting down on emissions and fossil fuel use. Um, <clears throat> produce zero waste, talked about composting, um, collecting food scraps, and then conversely, our scraps going to animals to eat versus, you know, us using them to compost. Either way, they're getting used uh, beneficially, I guess. And then procurement, uh, we, we try to deal as much as we can with local organizations, so tunnel vision hoops, um, <clears throat> and then local purchasing of equipment and, and green products, whether, whether it's just cleaning supplies or reusing old pallets for, for compost bins. Um, sure, sustainability is a key message. We can see that and eat like an animal, and then our future efforts at uh, education at Helen Arnold. I uh, already talked about rainwater collection and then promoting local food and, and we've done that. So I don't know if we want to pause here. I was just going to send some, I was going to show you a few other things we might be thinking about in the future. I don't, it's up to you guys. It looks like it's about 5.54 now. So it's up to you. Yeah. Do you want to open, open yeah. for questions? Yeah. That's fine. So any questions? Yeah. Yes. Is all that from the foundation? Well, what happens with the paycheck, you now we pay minimum wage, which is uh, fairly unique. So some other training programs will not do that. Um, when you set up a, a vocational training program, there is a certain amount of reimbursement through your local county board of DD. Um, and so it, it works out to be about even. We're not making money on it necessarily, but it, it helps us to provide those paychecks to those, those people. 
Yeah, I, unfortunately, and it's, it wasn't designed this way, but we just got our first female participant this month. She started literally a week and a half ago. Um, so for whatever reason, uh, whether it be working outside or the type of just the perception of working on a farm has only really attracted uh, male participants to our program. Uh, but we do have several female uh, job coaches. Yes? Are all nurses disabled individuals? Yeah. Yeah, we have, um, at least in our program, is generally higher functioning adults. Um, but we do have a variety of disabilities. So where Center for Discovery is specific to autism, uh, we have guys that had traumatic brain injuries, whether early or late in life, um, you know, mild to moderate uh, mental retardation. We do have a couple guys with, you know, autism. So there's a spectrum, yeah. But again, uh, just for the work we're doing, it, it tends to be higher functioning folks, yeah. <clears throat> so I was curious, you, you use the term participants, right? Is yes. That, is that a particular choice that you made? Or it's, uh, it's just a way that uh, every organization will have a different way of saying it. So it can, it's uh, interchangeable with clients, individuals, participants. But not workers. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that you point that out, yeah. So when, they, when they, uh, the, um, the participants come to work, work for you, go through the training scheme yeah. program, um, do some of them, are, are some of them permanent or are you, are, are you having this study of uh, 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 participants coming through the program and moving out? Um? Yeah, the end goal is to have uh, our individuals graduate from the program. Um, and so that happens, uh, I've had about three or four guys that have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're not necessarily uh, a linear transition, so they might not necessarily be going to a nursery or a gardening center. But uh, they've learned the, the social skills, the interacting skills, to go and work at a grocery store, for instance, uh, stocking produce. So it's interesting. I, w I will go back to your worker thing. I might not have said worker, but I would say worker in, in most things. Uh, and their actual job description is garden worker. And I think for, for broad terms, I use participant or individual. But yeah. So. Yes? I'm just, just kind of wondering how you uh, learn all of the agriculture and, and all the techniques uh, and everything. But it sounds like you've been fantastically successful with uh, the produce. Mm -hmm. And um, you also got advice or, or training um, from the um, yeah. farmers. I was just wondering how, how that was cultivated and developed and, and uh, how you felt about uh, what you've learned. And maybe if, whether you've done any kind of innovation there at the site. Sure. In order to, in order to make the garden successful with uh, people that are working there. Yeah. So for for kind of learning how how to uh, farm, you know, it was a, it was a clean slate for us when we first started, um, and we hired on uh, William Murray, who I who I mentioned before, and he has a master's in plant and soil science. Yeah. So we've been able to kind of divide or. Um, delineate our certain tasks. Whereas, you know, I'll, I'll be involved with production planning and still have my hands in the dirt. He does a lot more with the technical aspects of, of the gardening. Um, but we had some other sources to draw on. Um, it was as simple as picking up an Elliot Coleman book from the library. Um, but we also were, were lucky enough to get linked up with Crown Point. And Crown Point has had that CSA in their agricultural program for, you know, going on 20 years. So a lot of our first agreement with Crown Point was that if we needed an assistance or some advice on, on what we're doing or what we're doing wrong, they would come over and they have a farmer who has a degree in agronomy that would, uh, I guess, consult with us on that. So, and then as far as um, any special uh, modifications to our work, um, yeah, I would, I would say so. So a lot of the steps that we take are, are broken down very simplistically. Um, we try not to throw too much at the guys all at once. Um, <clears throat> so whether it's planting out a bed or planting a, a seed tray or something, it's very simple steps and maybe we have a guy just poking holes into a plug tray first and then he can see someone else learn, uh, planting the seed. Um, but we also have different abilities with, with the different folks. So some, some guys may not work the rototiller, may not ever be able to work the rototiller um, and we kind of 
we pick and choose from there too. Uh, but we're, we're open to their choices. I mean, that's, that's part of our program is they have a choice to go out and work and they have a choice to do what they want at work. And if, if we can accommodate them or help them perform a task that they might not have before, we definitely try to do that, yes. Yes. Well, so bravo. Thank you. So every time a question popped up, you addressed it like immediately. <laughs> but um, it made me think about seeds. Are you doing anything with seeds? That was the only thing I think I can yeah. talk about. So. Um, seeds. So we are a little bit limited with our seed uh, sourcing. Uh, due to the organic certification. Mm -hmm. So through OFA, you need to source organically. So we, we make sure we do that. Uh, we basically go through uh, any catalogs you may find. So like Johnny's, we use Territorial. High Mowing is a great resource for organic seeds. But as far as like seed saving, yeah. uh, we have started to do more of that. So um, I think all the pumpkins that we planted this year were saved. Uh, same with tomatoes and peppers. Um, and so we'll continue to do that in the future. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. I, I, I don't mean to be keep focusing on money, but I just see these high tunnels. Yep. And I'm thinking, that's a big outlet. Yeah. And then you've got, so I can imagine that the old trail school must have paid for their own high tunnels. So, yeah, the question is about finances and, yeah. and funding. Um, well, as a nonprofit, a lot of what we rely on for, for some of these programs that we're running are, are donors, foundations, giving, and, uh, and grants. Uh, and so with what we've created w with our, our goals and with our mission, I think it's a, it's a worthy endeavor, and I think people have seen that. So we have been heavily reliant on grants, especially for some of the infrastructure things that you mentioned. So hoop houses were funded through, um, I think, the Akron Foundation, Atkin Family Foundation, and then we got a block grant for the greenhouses. And so, and uh, Summit County DD will provide some funding for us. So a lot of that is uh, funding. Um, and then when it comes to overall financials for the year, that's why we're trying to boost revenue as much as we can. Uh, I will say we have not hit the black yet, um, but that's what we want to do eventually, is once all these things are up and established and we can settle in, we hope that we can find a level of sustainability within you know, our business that we can continue that way. So we don't always want to be reliant on people you know, giving money. So well, that's infrastructure around the Akron Zoo, are they financial partners with? Yeah, the Akron Zoo, uh, well. I, I don't know, you know. <coughs> yeah, no, it's. You know, zoos are, uh, zoos are money-making yeah. kind of enterprises or not. They. Uh, as far as like providing finances for the development, they didn't provide much. They provided land. We have an agreement that uh, we are on the land for zero dollars a year, um, and we have to fund our own development of the sites. But we do have free reign on, on the space that they provided us. So a lot of the development, and this is true with Old Trail School too. You asked you asked if Old Trail School was providing funding. Um, they have not. We have the same agreement though. They have. They provide the land for zero in expectation that you know, we're, we're giving produce and the kids can come up and have free access to the, to the gardens. Um, but we found that in collaborating with these other organizations, it also adds value to our ask for, for grant monies. So not only are we uh, benefiting just Hattie's Gardens and the guys we serve, but we're also providing this educational opportunity for students and the produce that we're growing here goes to the cafeteria. So there's multi-layered benefits. And I think that's what we've noticed is you need to have multiple benefits. Uh, another thing they're really trying to stress now is job creation. So when we say we go into a new Akron Zoo site, we're gonna create an additional 15 jobs in two years. That's another thing that uh, grants and foundations really are looking towards. Thank you. And I, when you were mentioning traumatic brain in, in injury, the first thing I thought of is like the veteran population yeah. <clears> of Akron and, and all the stories of yep. that. And wondering, is that um, an untapped or yet to be? Yeah. Yeah, it, it certainly could. Uh, I think it's come up a couple times. 
we, we haven't dealt specifically with that population yet. Um, I guess it's uh, kind of hard to say why not, I guess, but uh, most of our individuals come through the, through the system. So a lot of the guys we're getting are straight out of high school, um, but they've had, they've had disabilities their entire lives. Um, but I, I could see that too. I mean, there, I'd see the potential. From a sociological perspective, kind of the interorganizational networking that's involved in this, I think it's really spectacular, right? Yeah. I mean, to see how many different community organizations have kind of collaborated yeah. in creating uh, this uh, kind of local food system. Yeah, it's, certainly. It's quite impressive. Yeah, they have a they have a nice network of resources up there. And Countryside Conservancy, I keep bringing it up, but they've they've been great to us. Uh, the Conservancy, which is separate, uh, is a Cuyahoga Valley National Parks um, land banking banking organization. Um, but we've we've found it pretty easy to collaborate with folks. And uh, next year we're looking at opening some additional land with AMHA. I'll slide through here because I was going to talk about that. Um, AMHA is uh, in the same neighborhood and uh, they have this land at Safferstein Towers and uh, our CEO actually went to high school with the director so that was a natural connection there and then talking to them about what we've been doing at the zoo uh, they were interested and they had plots and so we see expansion going to here and um, getting some of the residents involved from from that small That's thing. the housing authority, right? That's right, yeah. Ak Akron Metropolitan Housing. Yeah. And I, I wrote that there's a similar project in Ohio City for Cleveland Crops. Uh, Cleveland Crops uh, combined with CMHA, which is uh, Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Authority, and a couple other uh, organizations um, to form a six acre farm in Ohio City, which is right behind two of these towers um, for the CMHA. Uh, it's considered one of the larger uh, urban farm sites. It's, it's massive. Um, so that's worth looking up as well. Um, just a couple other small things. I mean, out of the food hub, I, I think I touched on distribution, but uh, this is something that we found in Chicago. It's called Fresh Moves. Um, this is the website. It was through an ac ac architectural <coughs> form that this idea was, was hashed out. But uh, this is produce delivery to food deserts uh, in a mobile market. So you outfit this old uh, Metro Transit bus with shelving inside and a cash register inside and you bring fresh food directly to people in this market. So another potential idea for us. Do you have a line of Hattie's Gardens jams, jellies, and chutneys? We, we do. <laughs> and where are they? <laughs> <laughs> Did you do research on the website? <laughs> We, we do, and uh, unfortunately, I cannot say that any materials that go into those are ours yet. And that's a, that's a problem for us, and that is what the Food Hub also comes into play, because we can start processing our own tomatoes for salsas and peppers. and So that's down the line as well, yeah. yeah. Yes? Have you had any issues with zoning in, in the city? Have you struggled with yeah, yeah, we ran into more red tape, I think, than we thought initially this year. Our plan was to open in, in June, and uh, we, I said we got open in, in September. Some of the things we ran into were basic uh, building code things for the pole barn, which lacked heating. I mean, it's, it's set on a slab versus a foundation. So it was, it was things with, with building structures. We ran into a small issue with uh, retail, so selling on site was another thing, because we're in a residential neighborhood. Um, but we went through the appropriate channels, the planning commission. It was just taking those steps, it was, and it was time consuming, but nothing was shut down. I mean, it was just, it was a pain. That was it. So. I wondered if the zoo would actually take care of this. They have a nice relationship with the city, so it helps to have them alongside, and uh, the zoo and the city are linked, but the, the zoo is its own nonprofit, but they've collaborated enough that uh, once we talked to the right people and put in the right information, it went fairly quickly, I guess. So, yeah. so all right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is, it's been a blast to come back. A little, 
little bit surreal to be at the front of the classroom. <laughs> yeah, back, so.